Well, um, you found us, if this is your first time here, or if you come all the time, we are in a brand new series called Jesus is Better. And, and, and what it means and what it's centered on is this idea that, um, that there have been people in our world. There have been people in our world that have, that have lived a certain way and, um, and, and have kind of stood for certain things, and then they've come up short. Like, like, no spoiler alert. Again, if you don't know much about Christianity, like the idea with Christianity is as humans, oftentimes we think we can figure it out. But we can't. And, and some well-intentioned, amazing men and women have tried to figure it out, but have fallen short. But we believe in a Savior. We believe in Jesus, not just as a fictional idea, but as a reality who came and stepped into each each situation where we've fallen short and fulfilled what needed to happen. And so to start this series, I want to start at the beginning. I want to start in Genesis. And so all week I've been thinking about beginnings. I've been thinking about beginnings and how stories start, how lives start. I've thought about my kids being born. I thought about myself, I, you know, I don't remember it, but me being born, the first memories I have with my parents, because beginnings matter. I've also thought, because July 11th was my anniversary, about this beginning, right? 23 years ago. 23 years ago, and I'll, get, I'll quote you what my boy Malik, I said, Dad, it's so cool that God let you have hair on your wedding day. <laughs> I said, you're right. (laughs) It was cool. He took it pretty quickly after that, but uh, at least then. See, when you're beginning something, you, you, you think it's the start, but there's something that's with you from before. See, Joy and I stepped into that day 23 years ago in, in Hawaii with family that surrounded us, but those, those families had given us something. Something's good. Something's not so good. My parents had divorced uh, when I was nine. Joy's parents had stayed together, but she'd be honest with you that it was a really rough upbringing because of the marital conflict. And so we had beginning, we had intention, we had our faith, we had love for each other, but there was also like not a lot of um, positivity that we had seen in marriage. There's a beginning with some beautiful things and the beginning was some not so good things. I think about that with my kids. Like, I love the day my kids were born. I love being able to hold them for the first time, to be a dad for the first time. I also knew there were things in me that I was like kind of bummed that I would give them. Quick temper. Always wanted to be right, right? Like there's a beginning, but there always is something before the beginning. Where does it really start? For all humanity, it all began in a garden. The Garden of Eden was what God created. This world is what he created, and he gave it to us. And he said, this is yours. Like, take the the, the kind of chaos and make order. He said, be together as, as man and woman and have kids. He says, make things beautiful. Live life with me. And they did it for a long time. And then they rebelled. And then they rejected God. They said they would think they would do it their way. He had told them, giving them just one thing that they couldn't do, but they did it. And all of a sudden, they started to see themselves differently. Shame crept in. And they lived their life differently. It says this in the book of Genesis. This is in the garden. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. This is after they sinned. Think about that. They were that tight with God. That they could hear him walking in the garden. He's coming to walk with them, to be with them. This is the way we were created to be. The Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. They hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So they think, he's God, he created us, he created this world, but I bet you we can hide from him. And they try to hide behind the trees. 
So the Lord God called out to the man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. It continues and says, then he asked, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? See, they had lived with God without shame for a long time. They had been naked. They had not known it. And then all of a sudden they eat this fruit. They rebel. And all of a sudden they start to, to see maybe their, their, their weaknesses or their issues or how they don't measure up. And so they hide. Then the man replied, that woman you gave me to be with, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. We'll talk about that in a minute. Adam. Adam is where it begins. And Adam has some traits as we start to walk through this that I bet you you have. That I know I have. See, because what happens is, is it starts there. But, it, but as people, as humans, relationally, we pass things on. And Adam does some things here that he passes on to us. It all begins in the garden where Adam hides. He does something he knows he's not supposed to do. He knows he shouldn't do. And so his first response is he hides. He's going to try to get away with it. Again, the logic would say, God created everything. God created you. How are you going to hide from him? We don't care about logic in those moments, right? We'll talk ourselves into anything. They won't notice. They won't find out. It'll never come out. He hides. I'm the oldest of, uh, of seven. That means I was an amazing babysitter. Um, my, my brothers and sisters wouldn't say that. Uh, and then I have two boys. So I've seen kids. And you don't teach kids this, but they'll take something that they shouldn't take. And you'll go, why did you take that toy? And they'll go, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. And they'll hide it behind your back. I'm like, I don't know what's in your hand. They're like, no, nothing. Your other hand. I don't have another hand, right? <laughs> they'll use insane logic to try to hide something. But don't we do the same? I see that destructive behavior that you're participating in. What are you talking about? I mean, it's cost you your job and it's cost you this relationship. Don't know what you mean. We hide. I get it. I, I hate the feeling of shame. I hate it. I hate to feel exposed. So we hide. It doesn't start with us started back in the garden. He hides. He blames. First time Adam sees Eve, do you know what he says? Oh, man, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. This was old school for like, she's hot. Like, she's amazing. Thank you, God. He's stoked. Then God comes to him. Why are you hiding? I mean, that woman that you gave me. <laughs> I don't know, man. She gave me this fruit, and I just had to eat it, I guess. Right? He blames. I want to put a few things in the category of blame. Blame, um, making, you know, uh, ex explanations, uh, justifications. Here's why I had to do it. It's what wells up in us. I, I don't want to speak um, for women because I'm not one, but um, I say this to my boys. I say one of the number one ways you can be a man is by not blaming, by owning your stuff. If you step wrong, say you stepped wrong. Admit you stepped wrong. Receive it. It's easy to go the way of Adam. It's what the world expects. Look at the political discourse. It's all blaming. 
It's all finger pointing. It's all there, the problem. I had never heard any politician ever go, I made a wrong decision there. And if they do, I've never, you know. We blame. It started in the garden. It started with Adam and it's passed down. And we hide and we blame. We'll even sell out people we love. Because we don't want to be wrong. We don't want to feel that shame. What else does he not do? He doesn't fight. I, di I didn't read you the story of when the, the serpent tempts them. But when the serpent comes, and what I mean by fight, he doesn't resist. Sin's coming his way, and he just takes it. He just says, okay. There's no resisting. There's no pushback. It's almost like he feels like he's a victim. And he just takes it. I've been in those situations. I know it's wrong. I know it's not okay. For whatever reason, I don't resist. The Bible, especially the New Testament, followers of Jesus, they talk about all the time that we, when we follow Jesus, we have a call to resist the devil. Resist these temptations. Push them away. Walk away from them. Call them out. Say no to them. But back in the garden, Adam started to go down a road that I would guess at one point in our lives, every one of us in here has done. We haven't fought. We haven't resisted. We've just participated. So about 24 years ago, 25 years ago, was the first time I ever went to a Christian church. And if I would have come on an open house day and heard a message like this so far, I'd have been like, wow, this guy's a downer, right? <laughs> but we have hope here. We sing songs and we clap and we praise because we believe in a Savior. See, there's two stories in a garden. There's one in the Garden of Eden that's bent on hiding and blaming and not resisting. And then there's one in another garden called the Garden of Gethsemane, where, where, where a true and better Adam steps in. And this is how our problem begins to be solved. Now, if you're like me, 20-something years ago, when I heard this, how do we fix our problem, I wanted to hear what I could do. Give me the 10 things I need to do that I can control so that at the end of the day, I can point and I can say, Kyle did it. I figured it out. Some of you haven't, and you're just not as good as me, right? I didn't say that part in my head, but I thought it. But this is not how Christianity goes. If a preacher ever stands up and says, this is how you figure it out, this is how you fix it, this is how you control it with your hands, it's not Christianity. That's back to something that would be in the garden. But Adam hides and he blames. But Jesus enters into the garden of Gethsemane and does something different. The answer lies in this garden. The Garden of Gethsemane, not the Garden of Eden. And what's going to happen in this garden is Jesus is going to be tempted on an unbelievable level. Jesus is going to desire to not go down a road that God has invited him to go down. He's going to be fully human in that moment, and he's going to say, God, this looks so hard. Can I please go this way? And he's going to have a choice, just like Adam had a choice. And what he does with this choice is change everything. Now, I don't do this very much, but I'm going to use a big, fancy, theological seminary word. I don't do this very much because sometimes when pastors use it, they're just trying to show off or look cool. But I want you to know it because it changes everything when you know it. It happens in this garden. 
And the fancy word is called double imputation. So when you're snacking on your Mr. Softy later, say, hey, what do you think of double imputation? What this means is that something's going to happen. Something's going to happen to humanity, and something's going to happen to Jesus. A transfer, of, is in, a, in a way, is going to take place. 2 Corinthians describes it this way. It says, he made the one, God, God is he, God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us. So he's going to take the sin of Adam, like all of those things that he did, all of the things that I have done, all the things that you have done. He's going to take all of that. And the one who knew no sin, he's going to give it to him. He's going to impute our sin onto him. This is profound. This is powerful. It doesn't have anything to do with you. You realize that? Like none of us have to qualify for it. That's the scandal of Christianity. Nobody in here gets to show a card that says, I actually qualified for it. This is what the grace of God is. God's saying, I'm going to take the sin of humanity and I'm going to place it on the one who knew no sin. That's the first part of double imputation. The second part, so that we, you and me, might become the righteousness of God in him. He takes the righteousness of Jesus and places it on us. You want to know why we get to be called sons and daughters of God? Double imputation. Do you want to know why we stand and celebrate? Double imputation. We, we talk about this a lot in here. Um, when God looks on us, which I think a lot of people think in their head, he looks at us and he just goes... Oh, man. I mean, I love him, but dude, did you see that week? He does not do that. Double imputation says he looks on him and goes, that's my boy. That's my son. I got to go to Ireland this week, and um, I met a few people there, brand new. You know what I was doing constantly? Pulling out pictures of my phone to show them pictures of my family and my sons. Like, I'm proud. They know nothing of baseball. And I'm like, here's one the other guy. He got a double. They're like, double, great. They don't know what that is, right? But I'm proud. And that's a, that's a hint, a glimpse of what your father thinks of you. Not because you're cool, but because Jesus took on our sin. And we received his righteousness. Like the scandal of the gospel the thing that I couldn't get, it took me three years. I went to a church for three years, and I would get close, and I would push back, and I would get close, and I would push back. Why? Because I could not humble myself to receive this gift. My pride, my desire to want to be able to figure it out just kept me resisting it. But the scandal of the gospel is Jesus gets what we deserve. We get what he deserves. How does this happen? Well, this story in the garden is wild. So the first story in the original garden of Eden, right? It's Adam and Eve living with God. Here comes the serpent, tempt tempts them with the fruit, they take it. This is a different story. This is a story where Jesus is now, God in the flesh. He's walking and living like us. He's lived perfectly, but he knows he's going to the cross. He knows he's going to die. He's, he's on the night before he's going to be arrested, literally hours before he's going to be arrested. And he goes to this garden called Gethsemane. Eden is a place of flourishing. Gethsemane is a place of crushing. It's literally a, a, a garden of olive trees. And they had olive, olive presses there where they would take the olives, put them in the press, crush them so they could get the oil. And they would do it three times. Three times. They would put the oil, they would put the olives in the press, and they had this massive stick, this massive piece of wood, and they would take a, a stone and place it on it, and then the person would push the stone down, crush. Oil comes out. Then again, 
second stone placed on the log, pushed, crushed, more oil comes out. Third time, here comes the stone put on there. Three stones now pushed, the final pressing, oil comes out. Oil in the Bible was always a significant picture when they would mark someone with oil of God's presence, God's peace, God's abiding. It was a picture of healing. It was a picture of reconciliation. And Jesus now goes to this garden where he's going to be figuratively crushed. I'm going to read you the story from the book of Mark. And it goes like this. Then they came to a place named Gethsemane. And he told his disciples, so his his tight friends, his best followers, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John, three of his closest, with him. And he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. If you don't know the story of Jesus, before this, you never see Jesus like this. You do see him grieve, but you never see him just so overcome. He said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake. He's like, can you just be with me? You guys are my boys. Like, can you just be with me? He went a little farther, fell to the ground, and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Basically, God, can we do this differently? And he said, Abba, which is like, Daddy, Father, all things are possible for you. You take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. So he's in the garden, and he's tempted now. He's saying, God, can we do this a different way? Can we go down a different road? This is so overwhelming. This is so heavy. This is so weighty. Can we make this happen in a different way? He gets up. He goes to find his boys, and they're sleeping. Then he came and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, are you sleepy? Couldn't you stay awake one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So one crushing has happened, the second one now. Once again, he went away and prayed, saying the same thing. And again, he came and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. They did not know what to say to him. Then he came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping? Are you still resting? Enough, he says. The time has come. See, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. The book of Luke says it like this way. It says, um, he kind of says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You see where Adam hides from the Father, Jesus runs to the Father? Like, like where, where, where Adam says, ah, I've sinned or, or, or something's wrong and he runs away from God. Jesus is like, I wanna, I, I'm distressed, I'm troubled, and he clings to God. Man, it's so in us to run away, isn't it? To hide. I say this to my boys, I'm like, if, if I can teach you... And when you are in trouble, running to God is always the best thing. Coming to me and your mom is always what I desire you do. Jesus runs to him. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Being in anguish, he prayed more fervently. This is his third time. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus enters into this moment. Like Adam, he's tempted, but he doesn't hide, and he doesn't blame, and he resists, and he fights. His friends fall asleep. The anguish of all of our sin is gripping him, but he says, I will trust the Father. 
He's arrested, and the process begins. That eventually hangs him on a cross where the double imputation truly takes place. Where he gets what we deserve, and we get what he deserves. And what it says is it says in the book of Hebrews that he does all of this for the hope and the joy that is set before him. Because like the Father, he wants to be with us, know us, deliver us, redeem us, save us. It all started in the original garden. But that doesn't mark us. That doesn't name us when we follow Jesus. No longer are we people who blame and hide. No longer are we people who who make excuses and, and fail to resist. We're people who trust Jesus and start to learn what it looks like to walk as sons and daughters of God. So it starts feeling hopeless and ends feeling so hopeful because that's how good our God is. Every week here at Refuge, we take communion. And we take communion to recognize this. And when we take the bread, and this is um, for people who follow Jesus, you take the bread and you remember that that is his body broken for us. The cup, his blood poured out for us. So in a second, during worship, you're going to get a chance to do that. But before, I want to show you a video clip. And it's a clip that comes from the TV show, The Chosen. And what I love about it is it's Jesus seeing oil being pressed. It's before he's arrested. It's before he goes to the garden. But he knows what's going to happen. And what I love about it is he sees the pressing, and you see the anguish, and you see the pain, and you see the fear. But what you also see at the end is you see a man walk up, a man who had given his life to Jesus, a man who had been redeemed by Jesus, saved by Jesus, and Jesus locks eyes with him, and he knows it's all worth it. So when you leave here today, don't hang your head. When you leave here today, you are not Adam. When you trust in Jesus, you are a son and a daughter of God who he gladly stepped into the garden and changed everything for. Jesus is the true and better Adam who resisted the temptation and saved all of us in doing so. Let's pray. God, you are so good. Thank you for today and to get to be with these folks. Thank you for the way Jesus... um, steps in in every situation each one of us is struggling, just like Ed, and saves us, delivers us, redeems us. God, as we worship now, as we go to celebrate with ice cream and, and water slides, God, would we just remember what you give us? Would you give us the righteousness of Christ? So would we walk with our heads held high and our hearts full of gratitude and love for the God who gave us that. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.